August 27th, 1979, Lord Mountbatten has been killed aboard his boat along with others. But his killer, seemingly, was arrested hours before he even died. Louis Francis Albert Victor Nicholas Battenberg, better known as Lord Mountbatten, was born on the 25th of June 1900. He was great grandson of Queen Victoria, second cousin of Queen Elizabeth and an uncle to Prince Philip. The royals have a bit of a mad family tree. He was like big into the navy and stuff. So I'm just going to list a couple of his like titles. So he was the first Earl of Burma, the last Viceroy of India, and a supreme allied commander of Southeast Asia. So basically he saw like the, uh, oversaw the last days of British occupation in India. In July, 1922, he married Edwina Cynthia Annette Ashley. They all have mad long names. She was an heiress and socialite and they would go on to have two daughters. Their relationship was quite complex. Um, it seems like they had an open marriage and they had a lot of different lovers, particularly Edwina. From what I can see on the in from the internet, uh, she had a lot of different lovers. Two consenting adults, we don't care. He would go on to become a close member of the royal family. His biographer, Philip Siegler, said that he was an integral part of the post-World, the post-Second World War uh, royal family. He was mentor to the heir, Prince Charles, and he was affectionately known as Dickie. Cassiebon Castle was located in the idyllic and quiet town of Mullock Moor in County Sligo on the northwest coast of Ireland. Um, it's kind of in between Sligo and Donegal, so like it's kind of part of Donegal Bay. It was actually inherited from Edwina's family and they didn't really travel there uh, while she was alive. But after she died, Mountbatten kind of made it a thing then that the family, you know, would go off every year to Ireland and holiday and spend time together, you know, with his children and then his grandchildren. This annual visit from Mountbatten and his, you know, entourage was welcomed each year by the residents of Mullock Moor. Um, I think, you know, in the beginning, obviously, it brought a bit of, an, of excitement, but also it brought jobs because, you know, they would need people then to serve, you know, serve food, cook food, clean, stuff like that while they're there. So it also created employment in the area. Mountbatten enjoyed uh, heading to Classybon, uh, really to escape, I suppose, like, you know, the, the life of a royal or the life of you know who he was uh, back in England and to kind of just live a normal life. Most of Mountbatten's time would be spent on the Shadow Five which was his 27 foot fishing boat. Um, it had been made by local like boat makers in Mullock Moor to his specifications so it had like a toilet on it which would have been quite rare. Uh, in 1979 it was 10 years old and the so it wasn't in the best condition and the green paint you know had started to like chip and stuff like this but it you know but it was still a nice boat in previous years there would have been security so um you know when it was docked at the harbor there would have been security you know watching it and stuff but that year Mountbatten actually stopped this in fact Mountbatten detested security uh he had actually like lessened it you know over the years he would not allow the guardy to come aboard his boat. He would not allow them to like accompany him when he would go out sailing. You know, like they, they'd accompany him on a speedboat. He wouldn't allow that. He would allow a bodyguard and like a second guard. So there was uh, his bodyguard, which was Kevin Henry and another member of on Garda Shea Connor. So they would be with him. So if he was at the house, that's where they were. If he was out, that's where they were. Then there would be, you know, re regular patrols by the guardy uh, on the Donegal to Sligo Road. Again, this was down to him, you know, I think wanting like just wanting to live a bit of a simple life when he was here in Ireland. Um, he really enjoyed and liked Ireland. And I think, you know, the fuss of having so many security and stuff, he just wasn't into it. And like that, as he was getting older, he just lessened it. So some sources say that there was like a direct threat from the IRA against Mountbatten. That's the Irish Republican Army. And some make it seem like, you know, there was no actual direct threat, but, you know, there was obviously the general threat because of who he was and where he was. So, uh, Mullock Moor is, you know, quite, uh, you know, it's a very quiet area, but it's actually only like 10 miles from the border of Northern Ireland. And there was 
uh, the British occupation of Northern Ireland. And so in 1979, the Troubles were going on, which was a time in Irish history, uh, again, in nutshells. Uh, it went on for 30 years. It was basically the Unionists against the Republicans. So the Unionists um, obviously, you know, wanted to stay with within the United Kingdom. They wanted to be under British rule. And the Republicans basically wanted the six counties back for the rest of Ireland. They wanted a united Ireland. So, you know, this was an awful time. It was, you know, a lot of a lot of lives lost on both sides. Um, but it was said that, you know, Mullochmore, even though it was only the short distance away, it, it was like a different world. You know, they just they obviously would have been aware of what was going on, but they'd never experienced anything like that. And obviously because of who, you know, who Mountbatten was. So he was, you know, a close confidant and uh, of the royal family. He was mentor to the heir and he was, you know, holidaying in Ireland, albeit the Republic, but at the height of the troubles. So the Sinn Féin president at the time in 1979, uh, Rory O'Bradog, I'm probably saying his surname wrong, um, Sinn Féin was a, is a, was, is a political party and it has ties to um, the IRA. They, Sinn Féin would obviously even now, you know, want a united Ireland. And Rory basically says that in the uh, 60s, there had actually been an application to, you know, to put an attack out on uh, Mountbatten. But yeah, again, it was in, he would have been in the Republic and at the time they didn't think it necessary to like bring it down so he basically said that the application was rejected but by the late 70s things had gotten a lot worse every year before Mountbatten's visit uh the police in Dublin and in London would uh you know assess the risk basically for him so they said you know there was no direct threat but that all like obviously coming to Ireland at that time who he was everything would always carry some amount of risk so, you know, so went back and went. Now, it is kind of said from some sources that even if they had said to Mountbatten, like, there's there's too high a risk for you to go, that Mountbatten would have went anyway. Um, I think, you know, he was at, a, like, he was 79. I think at that age, he was kind of like, I'm going to do what I want to do. What happens, so be it, this type of thing. He's also, um, it's also apparently that he said, you know, who'd want to kill an old man anyway? So Mountbatten and his family arrived at Castlebon Castle in August 1979. Uh, so with him were his two daughters, Lady Pamela and Lady Patricia. And then uh, Patricia's husband, Lord Brayborn. Uh, their two 14-year-old sons, twins, uh, Nicholas and Timothy. And then Pamela's mother-in-law, Lady Dowager Bray Brayborn. She was 83 at the time. And then a friend, Hugh Tunney. So Mountbatten by this point is like travelling to Mullochmore the last 20 years. Mountbatten would need a boat boy for, you know, for the duration of his trip. Uh, so he actually asked a local to try find, you know, find someone. So the local, this man, asked John Maxwell if his 15-year-old son Paul would be interested. The Maxwells were actually from Enniskillen, which was across the border in Northern Ireland, and they were on their family trip at the time. So Paul was over the moon and said yes. So he would uh, be, you know, like putting out the cushions uh it says pumping out I'm assuming that means like if there's any water in it you get rid of it uh like that then you know at night you know kind of cleaning up washing washing it down and stuff like that putting the putting the fish and tackle and stuff out the Maxwells as I said were from Enniskillen so you know uh they would have been aware of the trouble John Maxwell would later say that you know obviously you know, obviously they were aware of the troubles, so they would have been aware of the risk again against, you know, Mountbatten being there. But, you know, they, they allowed Paul to do this because he was obviously so delighted to do it. And all, also he said, you know, if the IRA wanted to kill Mountbatten, they had other ways to do it without involving children. So it had been raining uh, for a few days before the 27th, but... That morning it was, you know, it was bright and sunny. So Mountbatten and his party had breakfast. And then at 9.30 a.m. Uh, Mountbatten informed Kevin Henry that they would be going down to the harbour to go out fishing for the day. At 9.40 a.m. Garda James Lowen stopped a car coming into uh, Granard, Longford, a red escort. This was actually like a routine anti-terrorist checkpoint. 
So as he approached the car, he said the men, the two men in it were quite visibly like nervous. Uh, you know, he checked our tax disc and stuff like that. And then he asked, you know, asked them where they were going, this kind of thing. Uh, the driver was like very visibly nervous. He said his name was uh, Patrick Real. He said the car was his, but when asked, he couldn't give the car reg, like the registration number of the car. Um, the passenger said his name was Thomas McMahon, but neither man had identification on them. So the guardy asked the driver to step out and open the boot. He said that the man just got more nervous. He said that when he went to the to open the boot, he couldn't even like do the key. The guard had to help him open the boot. Um, so at this point, like the guard is even kind of getting a bit nervous because he's getting suspicious. So he called for assistance and the two men were taken into custody. At 11 a.m., Mountbatten and his party started, you know, packing the car with like picnic baskets and this type of thing and left for the harbour. They arrived at about quarter past. Kevin Henry said, uh, the bodyguard said that the tide was low. So he actually, you know, helped um, 79-year-old Mountbatten and 83-year-old Lady Dowager down onto the boat and then obviously left because they're not allowed to stay on it so um he would have then gone to his car with uh, the other guard john maxwell actually made his way down to the shop to get a paper uh from the shop at the harbor and he said um you know he looked across and saw his son you know getting things ready on the boat and stuff so that they waved at each other and that was it so the boat you know set sail so lord Mountbatten was at the you know at the controls steering and stuff uh Lady Patricia and her mother-in-law sat at the back of the boat. Lord Brayborn and his two sons and Paul sat at the main body. Uh, Lady Pamela and the friend Hugh Tunney didn't go. So they sailed, you know, out of the harbour and over to where, like, the lobster pots and stuff were because they wanted to check on them. So Kevin Henry and the other guard drove along the cliff to, like, keep an eye on them. Dennis Devlin, a young lad, uh, you know, was walking along and saw the boat knew who it was and knew that they were going to be going over to the lobster pots so he actually stopped you know to watch and see see kind of like did they catch anything or whatever so dennis says that he saw someone you know lean over to like get the the pot out and that was it in his words the boat seemed to just lift out of the water and then just explode it split into like a million pieces uh i see many many descriptions of it being like matchsticks in the water in one uh, BBC interview I saw from that day, Peter McHugh, uh, the owner of the Pierhead Hotel, would you know would be asked what was the condition of the boat, and like he just replied like non-existent, like the boat was just gone. So Kevin Henry, um, obviously like they sped to the scene. As the smoke settled, you could just you know you could see all the pieces and you could just hear the screams from the bodies in the water. John Maxwell, who was back at home, heard the sound and knew it was a bomb. He, you know, uh, drove down, he, you know, got down. Um, he said that he lost the head. Obviously, you know, like you can hear, you can hear people screaming in the water. And like you're, like you're sort, I suppose like you're nearly sort of hoping that one of them is your son screaming because otherwise it means that he's dead. Um, but he said he lost the head and he just tried to try to get down as like quick as he could. And this was actually where Dennis Devlin was. And it was, you know, like with the cliff. So Dennis Devlin said in the in an interview, like there was just there was just rocks below. Like he would have just dropped to his death. Like so he had to be held back because he obviously just wasn't thinking he just wanted to get to his son as quick as he could. So boats, you know, from the harbour made their way out to, to you know, get the bodies. Uh, Lord Mountbatten, his legs had essentially been blown off so he drowned his grandson nicholas also died in the blast john maxwell was originally told that his his son uh was alive and that paul was up in the pierhead hotel where they had brought you know they were bringing people um so he went you know he went in and he said that you know he saw a fair-haired young lad and at first he thought it was paul and you know wanted it to be paul but it wasn't it was fair-haired timothy so Timothy, uh, Lady Brayborn and Lord Brayborn had, had survived but had injuries. John then went back out um and had then been told that no, they had they had picked they had picked Paul's body out of the water. Um so he went and 
held his son um he said his body was still warm and you know he just he just hoped that he was still alive and he you know he knew he wasn't but he said you just wish you just hope that he's still alive but he he also died in the blast the lady dowager would be brought to Sligo hospital along with the other survivors but she would die the following day from her injuries John Courtney of the murder squad in Dublin headed down to Sligo along with the rest of them to investigate. So, you know, they questioned the survivors, they questioned other people. They found out that a 50 pound bomb had been placed under the floorboards of, of the Shadow 5 near the engine. Um, they said that for that to be placed there, Someone would have had to either walk to or swim to the boat, get on, like board it and, and do it. Obviously, the boat was left unattended at night, so they reckon it was put in the night before. Later that evening in Longford, a uh, guardie recognised the man who said his name was Patrick Rehill and knew him as Francis McGurl and that he was known to be a Republican sympathiser. Neither men were speaking. Uh, so they were arrested under Section 30 of the Offences Against the State Act, 1939. Francis was the, you know, most nervous of them. And apparently during questioning, he just blurted out, like, I put no bomb on that boat. And so obviously the guardian were like, what boat? You know, and that was it. And he shut up. John Courtney says that they were aware, you know, of Thomas McMahon and uh, that he was an explosives ex expert and a member of the Provisional IRA. Some sources say that he was from Monaghan, which would have meant he was, you know, from the Republic. And some sources say South Armagh, which is part of the North. So they now strongly suspected that it was, you know, these two men were responsible for it. Um, as I said, they knew that someone either had to walk, you know, along the sand to get to the boat or like swim. So they took samples from the paint from, you know, remaining bits of the boat and they took sand from the beach. They then took the clothing of the two suspects and stripped their car down as well. Only a couple of hours after uh, the explosion in Mullochmore, an explosion killed 18 members of the British Parachute Regiment in Warren Point, County Down. Our Taoiseach, which is like the Prime Minister, uh, Jack Lynch was on holidays at the time, so he actually cut it short to come back. Prime Minister of England, uh, Margaret Thatcher, was furious. She flew straight to Belfast and visited the survivors of Warren Point and like visited the streets of Belfast and so like that. I saw one documentary describe her as like an ambulance chaser. So she wasn't really, she didn't really care about the situation in Northern Ireland. She didn't really, she wasn't really bothered about the, the troubles in, in terms of trying to solve it. Um, and it was more so when something like this happened then she she would rush to you know visit people in hospital and stuff like that so she was dealing with it like on and on like case by case basis but wasn't looking at like the whole picture she like one source said that she had like tunnel vision when it came to this the funeral of Mountbatten was held in Westminster Abbey on the 5th of September Prince Charles done a reading as a mark of respect every shop and business in Sligo uh, closed their business for the day so obviously, you know, members of our government went over. So the Taoiseach, Jack Lynch went. Uh, the Minister for Foreign, Foreign Affairs, Michael Kennedy, along with other people, would have went. After the funeral, they met uh, Thatcher. And she was furious. Like, she demanded, uh, you know, she demanded more cooperation from, from the Irish government. And Jack Lynch explained to her that, you know, like, the IRA is a problem for the Republic just as much as it is for England. You know, like, that it's... It's causing problems on both sides, this type of thing. And apparently someone at this meeting made a comment saying that there may be some who would sympathise with the aims of the IRA, not necessarily their means or methods, but, you know, what they were trying to achieve. And apparently Thatcher went mad. She, like, jumped up, slammed the table. Someone said that she nearly looked like she was going to leap across the table at the guy and, like, screamed, like, are you condoning murder? If, like, if that's your thinking, we're done and Jack Lynch you know had to had to calm her down like and had to sort the situation out. Uh, the IRA quickly claimed responsibility for the attacks both in the Republic and in the North like graffiti started going up everywhere in Republican areas that said 13, 
13 gone but not forgotten we got 18 and Mountbatten um so this is basically referring to the uh, bloody sunday or the bogside massacre that happened in 1972 british soldiers shot 26 protesters like in a pro in a protest match um 13 died outright and then one actually died later and his injuries were attributed but that's the 13 that they're referring to who died in in the bogside massacre or bloody sunday the bomb that was used in in both attacks uh was highly like developed it was highly skilled uh you know in one of the documentaries that i was watching it said you know like the ira would have started out with like putting petrol into like a bottle and putting the rag in you know and lighting it and throwing it and they developed their skills and now they were taking um you know like a, like a uh, an electric like boat or race car or whatever you know like the remote control ones they were taking like that control out of it and attaching it to the bomb so that they now had like a bomb that they could detonate. And so that's what was used here. Thomas McMahon and Francis McGuire were tried in the special criminal court. So that's a court that we have here that is like juryless. It's just a judge because it's for like uh, terrorism and organized crime, organized gangland and stuff. And it was founded in 1972. So in November 1979, they were both tried. So doc Dr. Jim Donovan, uh, head of the forensics unit, would be like the most important witness. Um, so I'm just going to read out some of the uh, uh, evidence because there's a lot of big words. Traces of nitroglycerin and ammonium nitrate were found on the clothing of McMahon. These were the uh, main components of the gelignite, which was the bomb. So um, if you remember earlier, I said that the Shadow 5 like the paint and all, like it was an old boat, so like the paint and all was chipping and stuff. So they found uh, green paint chips in McMahon's clothes, shoes and socks. And these matched the paint samples taken from the boat. The odds of uh, the paint flakes being different was 250,000 to one, which is a lot. But when you hear of other things where it's like 10 million to one, it doesn't seem like a, like a lot. A micro analyzer was then used to compare the sand samples by way of x-rays um, and they were identical and apparently sand is amazing apparently like sand sand is not the same anywhere so like different beaches and all will have completely different sand isn't that just crazy other sand samples that were taken from different beaches in the area were were different like so it had to be from that beach my girl had the same sand on his footwear and he had the same two ingredients barely the big long words that i said on his clothing as well so the case relied heavily on, you know, like the forensics um, and circumstantial evidence. You know, they had not been seen getting on the boat or anything like that. There was no witnesses. Dr. Jim Donovan's testimony seemed to be like the big point. And it was the paint chips that was the like decisive component, decisive thing that made the court, you know, agree that they'd done it. So the court was satisfied that Thomas McMahon had handled the bomb and that he had placed it onto the boat with the intention of killing those on board so he was sentenced to life imprisonment and was in port leash prison um and in 1998 he actually got out as part of the good friday agreement the good friday agreement again in a nutshell was the agreement um between the ira and the british for like a ceasefire so that happened in 1998 after 30 years of the troubles and thankfully the ceasefire is still going to this day. Francis McGurl was uh, not convicted. He walked free from court. And he actually died years later. I think like 15 years later. Um, by being like crushed by his tractor. Apparently he was like really drunk. Now. Because we all love a good. We all love a good like rumour or two. Um, One article. I'll just link it down below. One article said that um, it was the SAS who had made it look like an accident because like that they were saying like they couldn't let someone get away with with killing you know someone so prominent in their uh, circle one other rumor or, or theory or whatever that i'm going to put out there again i'll link it below uh was that mount batten was uh for want of a better word or not a pedophile so i don't know it said that there was FBI documents that showed that he had a perversion for young boys. I saw one comment um somewhere, I think it was on Reddit or somewhere, 
that said like you know the, like boys and young men but in fairness they said young boys there's no confusing young boy meaning 18 years 18 years old that's not what you're talking about here um apparently I don't know, apparently two men who had been, you know, were interviewed uh, for a book with Andrew Lowney. And they said that they had been with uh, Mountbatten. One of them was linked to the Kinkora uh, Boys Home in Belfast, which which had like a, a paedophile ring. Um, so again, I'm just putting it out there. You can go look. I'll, I'll put the source below and you can just have a look at what you think. But anyway, the theory is that that was why the IRA had then now decided to like take him out so Thomas McMahon was obviously charged and convicted of the murder and Francis McGraw got off but the two of them were already in Longford by the time like before the bomb even went off so it, that means that someone else actually pulled the trigger they actually clicked the thingy and um, and they've never been found and mm, as far as I know, anyway, there's been no names to kind of say who it was. It was said that, uh, like, Mountbatten didn't want to grow old, that he didn't want to become a burden. And also, uh, his biographer actually said, in one of the documentaries, Philip Ziegler said, if it had been just Mountbatten in the boat, he would have been happy to go that way. Like, he was kind of saying, like, if he had been on his own and he was out there, it would have been this kind of real dramatic way to go. Like, you're killed by, like, the Queen's enemy. And, you know, just like that. It's such this big dramatic way to go. Although I'm sure that's not how he felt when he was dying. Um, but it's it's that it would have been, basically, the biographer said it would have been a great sadness that the other people died on the boat with him. So, like, his grandson, Lady Dowager, and, and Paul, the boat boy. And obviously that's, that's the most tragic thing about this, that Nicholas and Paul... Obviously, that the four of them lost their lives, but that they were so young, you know, and it was, it was really seen as a ba you know, such an awful thing like that. Even for those who would, for for people who could um justify like political murder, or whatever you know, like whatever way you want to phrase it, uh, for to involve children is what they they said the problem is. Years and years later, um. It would come out that Mountbatten shared, you know, the political beliefs or the political aims of the IRA, let's say. In 1972, a letter uh, of a Dublin diplomat who had spoken to Mountbatten apparently had, you know, spoken of like he, he, Mountbatten had spoke of a united Ireland and uh, kind of said if there was anything that he could do to help, this type of thing. And so the Sinn Féin president in, in one of the documentaries kind of said, you know, like, why didn't like he should have spoken up then he should have voiced that he believed that Ireland should be a united Ireland that they should they shouldn't be British occupation one of the things that came from uh the the two blasts where uh and it gave more insight you know it made people more aware of what was happening in the north and the troubles and you know it helps Thatcher to realize that security measures weren't enough to solve this problem a year after the trial, uh, Dr. Jim Donovan was actually also attacked by the IRA and a bomb in his car blew up in Dublin. He suffered serious leg injury, but he survived. Um, but they, it would cause him pain for like years onwards. In one of the documentaries, um, it speaks about, you know, how in 1979, they were going into the second decade of the Troubles and that Mountbatten, you know, had to, had to have known the risk that he was running by you know, because of who he was, and that looking back, now looking back at it, it's mad to think that he was coming here for all those years, and that that was just a thing, and that it was mad to think that it was safe to come here all those years. Uh, Rory O'Braddock also said, you know, like, again, like him looking back, you know, he's saying, like, he was very ill-advised to be told that he could come here, and, you know, like, like, what was he thinking coming here during that time? regardless of it being on the Republic and what was you know the people who were advising him that he could go or that it was okay to go like what were they thinking like so I decided to do this case because um coincidentally obviously it was featured recently in the crown so it's kind of been getting talked about on I think both sides of the the Irish Sea and um 
but coincidentally it's actually in my book uh, it was murder and it's just in that and that's how I read it and that's how I really that's the details it has about the forensics and stuff and I just thought it was an interesting case anyway like the sand and the paint is really interesting I didn't know about this the sand that it's different um and obviously it's on the crown at the moment but like the crown let's be honest is not a documentary and it's not not everything is in it is factual uh like the letter that Mountbatten wrote to Prince Charles before he died that doesn't exist so obviously there's a lot of dramatization and exaggeration so I just thought it was important to kind of get some of the facts down um you know especially kind of details especially like with Paul and stuff like Paul deserves to have his bit of the story told um it's interesting that the crown doesn't like it doesn't list anything it doesn't even speak about the IRA until that episode but in season three that's like when the troubles and stuff began so it's just interesting that they're not even it's not even spoke about like um when it's as much a part of the UK history as it is the Irish and I think sometimes that's forgotten um yeah so I just thought I'd do something different but this is an interesting case I thought that like the person who made the bomb was already you know the, the killer was already in police custody before it even happened it's just crazy I hope I'm not leaving anything out if I am sure let me know um obviously I like there's so much more to the history before all this and after all this and you know do go check it out I'm just putting it in a nutshell to give you I'm just covering the, the, the case of you know Mountbatten's death um, and I'm kind of putting some of the other stuff in nutshells please do not take what I'm saying exactly literal because I'm obviously just trying to explain it um, yeah so let me know what you think thank you again for watching uh, please subscribe obviously I'm still growing my channel and stuff like that so if you do like it like let me know um, let me know what cases you enjoy the most as I've said before the cases that I like the most are the unsolved particularly disappearances um, yeah so thank you for watching and listening and we shall see you in the next video thanks